We'll now move into um, facts about the, um, the Greenway. Um, you know, it's often been said everybody has the right to their opinion, not everybody has the right to their own set of facts. Um, and so we, we want to get the facts as we know them. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Um, that's not an editorial comment, Bill. Yeah, I apologize. <laughs> no problem. Um, the, uh, and so we, we want to take this time in public session to go over some of the facts that have been, um, that, that, as we understand them. Um, th this is to simply set a framework for the discussion. Um, and the agenda for today has been transparency that I think we've just concluded. And now we'd like to go in. That was a perfect idea. Um, thank you, Anne. Thank you, Kristen. I don't know if you've you, you yet seen the PowerPoint, but um, the uh, public-private model is um, something we'd like to talk about today. Transparency first, that we'll just sort of go over a little bit, Jesse, if we could. Um, we just adopted a transparency policy, um, and some of these things we've talked about already in that in that discussion. But we just wanted to. Um, this will be on our, our website, so you can have it. Um, that there are many documents available. We do have public meetings four times a year, which is very unusual for a 501c3. Um, and it's in recognition of, of that we're a special 501c3. Um, they're posted on our website. Um, we have the Guide Star Seal for Transparency. We've had that before the last two weeks. Um, we had that with um, because of the policies that we have, and now that we've codified them, I think we should get superstar, but I don't know if we will. Um, new, t new today is that the board adopted the clarification, and so we, we, we know we are certainly in the realm of best practice by codifying that, and we're thrilled to do it. That's okay. uh, but now the public-private model. Um, <clears throat> this is something that if, if you get our emails, um, then you've seen this slide. Um, this is something we sent out to our constituency, which is about 6,000 people on our email list. And I encourage you, if you're not, to please make sure you are on our email list. Um, and you will get lots of information from us if you do. Um, so it, it, it does go to the government support is very important, essential for the Greenway. But it is leveraged by the other support that we get from private philanthropy. Um, so we want to now go on to fundraising efficiencies, which is one of the questions that was raised um, in the last two weeks in the, in the press. Um, Can back just one second, because I think there's a critical thing that we need to understand. That the decision to have a public-private partnership wasn't a willy-nilly kind of decision. There was a lot of analysis and going back and forth over the years to, to reach that decision. And you know, I may be stealing your thunder, I apologize, but it's... It, 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 it's, uh, it's, I think, Chris, you said it, we're, we're somewhat unique. Well, uh, a grammarian would probably argue with that. You either are or you aren't. Um, but uh, I think, we, you know, I will take your point. But there are other examples in other cities that you're going to see as we, as we get into this, that where this does, in fact, work. So. Yeah, and, and not just for, I mean, we tend to concentrate and have in the past on park models that work in this public-private partnership. But in the research this, this last week, We've realized how many social services agencies operate on this, how many hospitals operate on this. I mean, there is, in the last 30 years, the government has clearly um, chosen a road that says public private partnerships are a very good way to go. Um, and and we're, we are a part of that. Um, the fundraising efficiencies. The fundraising, and I think my message is, and I know you've probably all seen this slide, but my message is fundraising is lumpy. Um, it, it needs great leadership and it needs great people doing it, and we're fortunate to have that. Um, but it, it does depend on both the times and the, the goals that you have. And so you can see that the recession really hurt us, as it did most nonprofits. And I know many of you represent nonprofits and Vivian's yadi, yadi, yadi. Um, that it, 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 does, it, it, it does make a difference. Um, so it's even though you could take one year and say our efficiency was not good, if you take it over a five-year period, I think that most people would say a seven-to-one ratio is really quite good. Um, and that's what ours is. Um, I'm going to run through these slides of the four different things, and then we can go back for discussion. But, but board and GLC, feel free to chime in, and then we'll open it up to open discussion after. 
Um, the cost tracker comparisons, again, I know you've seen this, um, but it really is important that we get benchmarked against like parks. Um, I come from a real estate background, so I'll use the analogy that if you have an acre of land with a single family home on it, it will cost you one thing. If you have an acre of land with a multifamily development on it, your costs will be very different. Um, we have acres of land that have fountains, hardscape, um, wonderful, wonderful amenities. We're built over a tunnel. There are parts of the Greenway that are not very deep, I will just say. Amazingly not very deep. And so it costs us to operate it because of those complexities. So even though it's, we're often compared to either, in the press, either large parks that, um, that have more economies of scale than the Greenway would and that are mostly wooded and grass, <coughs> Um, they may be urban, but they're nothing like us. We, we choose to um, benchmark ourselves against like parks. And we are efficient, and we will continue to be efficient. Um, and those are the comparisons. These are not ours. This was done by a separate outside group. Can yes. I, just as a quick question, do you know if the numbers are affected at all by looking at uh, other ancillary costs in addition to operational maintenance? We so I'm just wondering if that was, was, was chosen as a kind of a standard for those, or if there are other issues relative to either advertising, fundraising, administration, and things like that, that affect those numbers in any The reason way. we did this study was to, um, this was done several years ago, it was done um, in order to work with the state to say what our budget should be for operating and maintenance, which is the only things that they are, that they have, are paying for. So, um, of course, there'll be different things back and forth, but for example, none of the executive staff like Nancy is in our numbers, okay? So, and since she's the chief fundraiser, ably assisted by Jody now um, as the director of development, um, we, th those aren't in those numbers. And so we try, as you know, with any comparisons, you're gonna, you know, what? You, you, is it perfect? <coughs> Probably not, but it is endorsed by a, it was written, and, and endorsed by a, a group that is known for their for their studies like this. Georgia may is maintenance, horticulture, and public programs, exclusive of administrative fundraising, cost accounting, any of that. So I just for comparison purposes. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. The thing that strikes me about the slide is these are world class parks. And these parks have uh, such a strong identity in these cities. So when you're comparing the Greenway to these parks, and, and, and I think it's, it's a good comparison, it's, it's important to, to acknowledge how significant they are. These parks are in the character of the cities, uh, and they're world-class cities that these parks are located in. And in order to maintain these parks, you really need to spend um, a certain amount of money per acre uh, to to ensure that they remain world-class parks. In Georgia, if I may, I come from the same background as you in real estate. If you're, we talked about the leveraging effect. Uh, if you look at the uh, the, the increases in, uh, in value around uh, these various parks, there is a, a clear um, correlation between the quality of the park and um, and. Uh, and uh, Obviously, the real estate values along uh, the, the alignment of the parks. And if you take um, the High Line, for instance, um, there's been, uh, I think, anywhere from, uh, from a 40 to 50 percent increase in real estate values along the, uh, the High Line. It costs a lot of money, but people like it because um, it could, it's high quality. And I think that's something that we need to really emphasize. These, uh, all this, the, the increase in property values generate tax revenue. Uh, both for the city uh, and ultimately it attracts tourists so it increases um, revenue for the state. So if you look at all of those parks, uh, the, the, this idea that a park can be so much more than just a, a green patch of grass, but it, it really becomes an iconic um, presence in the city that, uh, that identifies um, the city as a world-class um, city. So I think that uh, uh, that's something that we need to, to, to constantly keep in mind as we look at these metrics. Um. For, Thank you. For context, could I just ask where some of the uh, parks that perhaps we're more familiar with, like the Public Garden, the Esplanade, Christopher Columbus Park, would fall 
in this scale. I mean, I understand you found six parks that you're, you're benchmarking, and maybe that's the ones you aspire to be. But for context with people that are in the community, in terms of where your expenses versus parks that we're familiar with. Um, first of all, I, I, I did look to you for your question, but we're going to try to get through this with the GLC and board. But let me answer it first, and then open it up to ge to general public. Um, I we did not do that because those parks that you mentioned are nothing like the Greenway. You know, they don't have the fountain, for example, the, the, the high maintenance fountains that we have. They don't, their, their proportion of grass to special features is wildly different than ours. So no, we haven't. Um, it also is my understanding, I wish Tony were here today, um, but that it was, it, it's very difficult for them to separate out how much they spend on the, the garden versus the common versus whatever, it's very centralized. So you can't take the world-class parks that the city operates and, and really understand exactly what the breakdown is. Um, but so, so no, we have not, but that was not the mission of this, of this study. I think it would be interesting. Okay. Jesse. Um, <clears throat> we, I, that is my understanding as well about the breakout of, of Boston Park's costs. Um, we have done this exercise, and I don't know off the top of my head, but we've done this exercise for Post Office Square, which is itself built over a garage. Um, and uh, though I don't have the numbers, they are comparable on this list. Um, and I mean, I think it's worth saying that we did not select these um, comparables. That's why we hired a third party, extremely respected, HRNA, to engage in this study. Um, and they, with their vast expertise, on sort of what was comparable to the Greenway selected the, uh, this group of parks. Thank you, Justice. Right, do we have a ratio of what the public and private dollars are for the other parks compared to what it is for the Greenway? Are the uh, Spine Park getting public money for? They are all getting public money. I don't know exactly what the ratio is. Um, I know, for example, Battery Park City is, um, is it was, a, it was a bid that they originally, you know, that, that was part of it and, and there was public money involved. I don't know the answer to that, but we can find out. One other thing is we talked about the special nature of the Conservancy and some of these other organizations. Uh, several members of the board had a, I think it was almost a full day tour of not the, not the top of the park, which you all see as you drive by, but what's below it. And it, for a novice like me, it was absolutely eye-opening to see the complexity of the equipment. I mean, you can you don't even know what you're walking over, and you go down, and it's like going into a nuclear submarine. And you look at the ring fountain, and the complexity. Of that just looking at the drawings is to what you have to keep going. It was it was really eye-opening, and it's all happening above a tunnel, not too far away. So. Um, okay, salary benchmarks. Some of the other things that have been raised um, is what we pay our senior staff. Um, particularly our executive director. Um, I wanted to take you through um, what the board did when we gave Nancy a raise um, last year. We went through um, different organizations, both locally and park organizations like us, so that we were able to capture Boston nonprofits as well as parks. Um, we took that data from their 990s. Um, we uh, took a look at the different ways to slice and dice it, number of employees, gross revenue, number of outside directors, method to establish executive director compensation. Um, we then looked at the range of comparison. It was a wide range. Um, as you can see from 149 to 459, um, the median was 252 and Nancy's salary is 185. Um, Nancy has not had a bonus in two years because of the recession, not because we don't think she's doing a good job. And um, we have set her salary now at 185. Um, Jesse, um, we wanted to give you a sense of what the other comparable studies showed. Um, uh, there was mention in some of the press of the Boston Herald website. Um, we went to the Boston Herald website. Um, the range that you see there means that it went from zero. There's some wonderful person who is doing it for free. <laughs> um, and up to um, a million eight, um, with the median being 320. Charity Navigator, um, which takes a wide range of nonprofits into um, their their decisions or their their studies, um, just released it. Jesse, what uh, late last year? 
um, the charity navigators? It's their, it's their 2010 study. There doesn't seem to be a, a, they have not yet released their 2011 study. Okay. Um, so, so this is a year. I thought it was more current than that. Sorry. Um, lots going on this week. Um, so that was 179. Um, our own study um, said it was 252. Um, we think, therefore, the 185 was well within reason um, for someone with the credentials and the ability of Nancy Grant. Um, Agreed. Okay. <laughs> and um, just because the Herald website is dense, um, uh, we took the Herald website and those are direct numbers from it. Um, and that was the zero to a million eight, um, or virtually zero to a million eight. Um, that we showed you before. This just graphically illustrates what's on the Herald website, if, if any of you have looked. Nancy is the one in red down by the bottom. Um, and so now, another thing that was raised <coughs> was the carousel costs and the revenues. Um, we are very excited about the carousel. It is going to be a truly iconic um, feature um, for Boston, for Massachusetts, for the Greenway. Um, and we are thrilled with it. Um, we therefore wanted to give you some, we won't show you all the pretty pictures, we know you've already seen all the beautiful, um, elegant designs um, that the carousel maker has done in conjunction with the children of the city of Boston. Um, but we did want to show you what, there was some question as to how much was raised privately and how much was raised publicly. Um, and so this chart shows you, um, we have some funds raised privately, mostly from one major donor. Um, we are getting that added to weekly as we speak. Um, we, so we still have some private funds yet to be raised. Um, the public fund was a, was a grant process that we competed for those funds. Those were not Department of Transportation just given to us funds. Um, we we want to tell you that there's been also some question of the cost of the carousel. Building on the Greenway is not cheap. Um, it is very difficult. It is over a tunnel. We need to respect that tunnel. And if you look at what the Harbor Island Pavilion, fabulous, fabulous structure, um, love the zero carbon footprint. I mean, the, the whole thing is just fabulous. But it was very expensive to build. If you had built that on, you know, a piece of land in, you know, somewhere else in the city that didn't need pilings, that didn't need anything else, it wouldn't have cost as much. Um, it costs to build on the Greenway. Um, our three million that it's going to cost about a little less than three million is certainly less than the than the Harbor Island Pavilion cost, and it's certainly less than the Heritage Park. Um, so we we need to have you understand that as we go forward and make improvements in the Greenway, um, it's very difficult to do it very inexpensively. Um, the, it was also um, uh, the impression left was that we were going to take in less revenue for the new wonderful carousel than we did with the perfectly fine rental fund that we have. Um, the rental you can see there, we've taken about 75,000 net to the Greenway. Our projection is for the um, revenue that for the new one, both because it will have more, more usage and because we will be able, it will be ours, um, we'll, they will double. Um, and, and so we did this both on an excellent and an iconic issue that we want to make the Greenway just the best it can be. And we also did it on very mindful of the revenues, which are so important to us as an operating nonprofit. So is that, yeah, okay. So we could do additional detail if you need it. Um, we might have the slide, we might not. If we don't, we'll, we'll try to get to it. Um, but I did want to open it up for real discussion with the board and GLC. If there's any questions or any comments that you want to make, we've sort of been doing that as we go, but I don't want to cut anyone off, and then we'll open it up to general public. I know none of this was new to you guys on the board. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I get, so I guess I'm not really surprised that you don't have anything. Um, and actually, it wasn't new to most of the public, I think. Um, we, we were simply um, just giving you um, some context um, for, for some of the issues that have been um, talked about this week. So any other questions, Diane? Um, on the carousel, of course you would increase the revenue if you have increased ridership, but you have increased costs because you're going to have to own it, you're going to have to winterize it, you're going to have to protect it. Have you done the analysis of what your expenses are going to be? Um, yes, we have. And sure. I think so. I mean, this yeah. is net revenue. Yeah. This so is net it's, revenue. it's net of operating and maintenance and, in fact, also capital replacement costs. Um, so we, 
the, the process of building a first class carousel includes a lot of research into um, operated, operators of other carousels and what their costs are and so on. So um, yeah, I think we're comfortable standing behind these numbers. And does that include your overhead costs? Yeah. Um, this includes this includes uh, some overhead, some uh, uh, I mean, supervisory yeah. costs yeah. that we will have if to. If you do. want, oh, it's I can pull the slide up. But I mean, there is a detailed um, sort of line by line. It has insurance costs. It has um, conservancy oversight costs, and so on, um, netted out against this number. So I'd like to see that. That would be great. Sure. And I think that it's wonderful that you compare yourself to these other world-class gardens, and that is what we all want here in Boston. However, the Conservancy has been unable to drive the kind of response and traffic like some of these other places. The High Line opened and within six months, despite the fact that you have to climb up four, sta four stories to get there, enjoyed 3.5 million visitors and they have 70% of their gardens in very rich horticulture. And the Greenland does not compare. So I think that's what our concerns are, that people that are saying, where is the money going? Because you can put it on paper, that's fine, but we're not quite seeing the results in the actual living and breathing in the city. We don't get tourist traffic out of it. <coughs> we hear from the leadership that it's a growing process, but the High Line has certainly sent a model that I hope that Boston could start um, following. Well, I'm certainly not going to compare us to New York after Sunday, but I, I will say that, um, that we, we do um, aspire to, to greatness, and Jesse just pulled up a slide that shows how it has increased um, occupancy or usage of the Greenway, um, and that, that's what we can measure. Obviously, we don't sit there with a, a clip count of, of how many people are really out there. Um, I also think that it is a function of the High Line got to open like one section and then another section, and I think the High Line is great. Um, but I don't think it, there are lots of people there. There aren't a lot of people who hang out on the High Line for long lengths of time. I mean, I've been there when they're making snowmen, and that's great. It's a, it's their counts are people walking you know, from one end to the other. We don't count that. We have no idea how many people come out of South Station now, and instead of getting to work farther into the financial district, don't go High Street anymore, but go down the Greenway and have a better life experience because of it. We don't know. So it's easier because of the way you get to the High Line. You know, there are, what are there now, four stairs? I think there I think there are four stairways now to the High Line. Um, it, it is easier for them to keep a count on what's going on. Um, so, although we aspire, we will never be New York. Um, we don't want to be New York, actually. Um, but we do want to have great, great um, yeah. usage of the Greenway. So, so, Georgia, these are numbers that are measurable. Measurable. We know how many food vendor patrons, they, they tell us how many people they've served every week. We know how many high five, Wi-Fi logons. We know how many people paid to go on the carousel. And we, we, the, the events and the program attendance is a pretty good good guesstimate, I mean, you know, for, for specific events um, and programs. So it's re a reasonable proxy that what you can't measure is increasing, maybe not at 72 percent, but at some really significant number. I, I would think, I mean, you, we're all, we all hang out on the Greenway from time to time. Um, you know, you see it. You, you just see that, that more and more people are using it. Um, you know, it, it, it takes a while for Boston to adopt a new thing, um, and we're, we're we're very glad that Boston is adopting the Greenway, and um, look forward to it. Does this include uh, the number of, of kids, for instance, playing at the, the, the Green Fountain? No, we have no way to gauge. I mean, we you know, short of having somebody sit out there with a clicker, we, we we really don't know how many people. That's why I say, anecdotally, I mean, we all know. I mean, you know that that we look. I mean, most of us, I think, love hanging out at a bench looking at the kids in the ring fountain from time to time. Um, but we don't we don't have a count on that. Yeah. Yes. To your, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, so I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, just to your point, um, the um, it, it's very easy, and I've been in enough boardrooms to see this, where the board sits around and congratulates itself on a job well done without looking out and seeing that the wings are falling off the airplane or something like that. And so that's one of the reasons that we have these open meetings to get the dialogues. We also have surveys, and we also spend a lot of time walking the, uh, the Greenway trying to get that input because that's exactly right. You know, it's all about continuous improvement. And as I look back 
you know, a few short years ago where we had hardscape out there and one tree in a you know, burlap bag. Well, so we don't, we don't want to be resting on our, our laurels. We've made a lot of progress, but, you know, we're hoping to get comments like yours to make it even better. So, thanks. Um, yes. Um, excuse me, my name is Peter Zaleski. I've actually been volunteering on the Greenway for three years. Thank you. With our horticultural staff. And it basically started when there were maybe two or three people would show up. Now we have the amounts of people that come to volunteer here is just amazing. I have watched from when um, Mass Pike was maintaining the Greenway. It was when I first moved to Boston. I walked through and I watched the man picking up the trash and left every tenth, you know, every other piece there. And I really watched the parks deteriorate, quite honestly. And as a taxpayer and a Boston resident, just having moved here, I found it a little disturbing. Um, so I said, what can I do about this? So I didn't really know about the Greenway. I found out about it, started volunteering with an amazing horticultural staff of about five to six people that work harder than anyone in this city, maintain high-end parks that are comparable to almost all of those parks that you have listed, which I have been to most of them. Um, I have watched from this summer um, where there, there weren't that many people. I remember seeing the Globe article where they showed some pretty, pretty negative things about the Greenway, and I thought, well, they've been working on this for about a year, basically. And it was really inaccurate. And then this summer, I watched the parks just explode. And the reason I know that is because I volunteer. We usually volunteer in the morning from 9 to 3. You walk through the parks, and people are sitting everywhere. The amount of people has increased exponentially, hugely, over the last three years. Um, the quality of work that the maintenance and the horticultural department do is absolutely outstanding with the resources they have. The parks are high-end. There are huge amounts of gardens, green space, trees, landscaping that requires lots and lots of work. You cannot compare them to the public garden or Boston Common. I could walk, I would take anybody and walk them through those parks and show them the broken fences, the broken lights, the cracked pathways, the poor landscaping. There's many beautiful things about the public garden, but it doesn't even touch the quality of the garden. So I'm happy to be a proud volunteer here I'm happy to see the amount of people that come to volunteer now. And I think you do an excellent job. Peter, I've never met you, but thank you. Nancy <laughs> <laughs> and this staff knows me. Well. I'm, I'm sure they do. I apologize for never having met you. But, uh, but thank you. Thank you for your volunteer, and thank you for that comment. And thank you for what, for what you're doing. And it's a great addition to the city. I, um, you know, I know a lot of people don't agree with the Greenway, but I'm always trying to support them. Um, Lisa, I actually connected with Boston Cares. Uh, who now sends us volunteers. So I've done a lot of things that have tried to bring people in. The amount of volunteers I believe they had last year, Nancy can probably attest to that, is tremendous amounts of people coming here and helping make this thing work. With a, a very limited, hard-working staff that is incredible. So, I totally um, agree on that one. Um, so thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Peter. Anne? Um, well, I concur with this gentleman that you are making progress. And it's exciting may not be at the speed that some people are looking for, but you are clearly making progress. And I, as some of you know, I have an historical interest in the plans for the Greenway and the capital projects, not so much the ongoing daily programs or the finances, but what will be on the parks um, going forward. And I think the recent discussion has been a distraction from the progress. But it also, unfortunately, has focused almost exclusively on the financing and the salaries, which, of course, is a tremendous distraction, but not so much on your capital projects and your planning, which I mean, one good example is the carousel. At the annual meeting, um, there wasn't time, really, for a complete presentation of your capital planning program for the coming year. And again, at this meeting, because of the distraction, there isn't time for that. So that's what I come to observe the meetings for. I don't come to expect to even have an opportunity to speak, but I hope that the next meeting, uh, there used to be more, but because there were leadership council meetings in addition to the joint board and GLC meetings, and we were able to get that information. So I hope when I come the next time, there will be an opportunity to get a complete sense of what your plans 
and capital programs are going forward. I would love that to be the focus of the next meeting. Um, <laughs> that would be wonderful, Anne. Um, and if we can, we will do that. Um, Matt? <laughs> I know I can always turn over here and say. I, you know, I'm sure the carousel is going to be just fantastic. I mean, it's, it's going to be, I think, world class. I, I, I picture seeing it in magazines around the world, as an example. As you know, I questioned the $3 million expense on it, whether it makes you know, logistical sense given the financials that you presented yourself, as well as that of the, the state and larger fees. My point is actually going to be in terms of, you know, as another example, and how you know, there are these, these public meetings that we come to, but there are plenty of private meetings as well. And the way the carousel was actually developed, we showed up at one of these public meetings. And we found out there was going to be a carousel, and that this was going to be the parcel. There was little discussion as to here or there, um, but that was it. And I get back to the point of, you know, and I really hope that folks in this room remember this, that this is public land. And it's all going to be privately funded, and that's great. And if he, she, whatever wants to, to fund it, that's great. But the public is going to be, you know, subject to this now for a very long time. That's something that, you know, Vivian's fantastic organization, if she wanted to build a water park in Boston Harbor, you know, she doesn't have a lease for Boston Harbor. You know, the Conservancy has a lease. And they can build buildings, they can put up structures, they can build $3 million carousels. That is the big difference, and that is the, why the standards need to be higher for the Conservancy versus other 5.3s. You know, Matt, there was a lot of controversy over the procedures that we went through with the carousel, and I appreciate that. And one of the takeaways that we've had from that um, is that we're clearly, as a board and a Greenway Leadership Council, we're clearly defining that we're in the process of saying, here are our 10 priorities over the next 10 years. We don't know which ones someone will come in and say, I'd like to give you a million six to do. Um, we don't know that. But we do want to be clear as to what what we would like to see done. and. We are moving towards that um, of certain members of the board and certain members of the GLC volunteering to be on those subcommittees that will look at that. And I think what will happen then is that it will be clear that we will be opportunistic in this in this framework. You know that we that we would like to see these things. There will be public comment on all that. Um, people can, can have the right to say if they think that this should be a priority or that should be a priority. Um, but it will be driven once. When we, and, and the carousel was on that list in some people's mind, but we weren't explicit enough about it. So we will be explicit enough about it. And we will get there. I go back to what I said about transparency, though. Transparency does not equal consensus. We will get all sorts of public input. That doesn't mean we'll take a vote of whoever happened to show up from the public that day. Um, we find that it's very difficult for people to come to a public meeting. Um, that's why we're happy to have it videoed so so you can you can show people who want to see it that way and we're more than happy to have the information on our website we get more we get input from people other than the public meeting people are busy um, they don't have time to take out of their day a couple of hours every quarter to come to a public meeting um, but we do want input and we will we will respect that input when we get it can I just add one? sure I would just thought was there were many things that I could think of and I've written about that could have been in that place. And I'd love to know where all the, the great visitors for the carousel are going to go to the bathroom. Um, that is, <laughs> I'm looking at some of our board members. Sure. Believe me, do we talk about that. Um, the, uh, we, we would love to solve that conundrum. Um, that, and we haven't. $3 and $3 million uh, is a lot of money of uh, restrooms. Well, the problem, if we could go back to the slide that talks about the revenue that we're going to get from the carousel, one of the things that we're committed to do is to not put things on the Greenway that are going to increase our, our costs without having an offsetting revenue. Um, doing public bathrooms would not only just be the capital cost, but it would be maintaining them. And the capital costs would be huge. Um, and the maintenance would be ongoing, and to do them right, I mean, of all the things that we can take on as a challenge to do right, public bathrooms would be way up there. Um, and so we haven't solved that. We don't know how to do that. So if, if, you, if you've got, I mean, if the public can give us some input into how we could do that, Jesse, have um, they done that? I think, uh, I think that 
Linda can talk a little bit to the, the position of the city and the history of thinking on public restrooms, because it certainly, in all the public meetings that we have, comes up regularly. Just briefly, it's been um, the city's position and for some time now that they do not want the Conservancy to be building public bathrooms on the Greenway. They would like to solve the issue of public bathrooms, for better or for worse, um, on the perimeter in new private development projects where they are, will be obligated to provide um, public facilities. We've, we've done um, a lot of analysis of other organizations that have a much larger footprint in their park to be able to locate these facilities in a sensitive way. First of all, the public has been very clear in our meetings, they do not, and particularly the neighbors, they do not want bathrooms in, uh, in their jurisdiction. So politically, it's a, different, it's a difficult issue, but most importantly, the city has been quite clear that they are looking at solutions for portable bathrooms along the perimeter sidewalks where there's larger spaces to accommodate them, um, as well as most importantly, obligating local um, uh, new private development as well as existing private owners to do it. We recognize this as an enormously um, major problem. It's sort of the people are going to have to go to the bathroom the way they do now with the rental carousel and the way they do with the Harbor Island Pavilion. Um, we welcome any suggestions about some innovative or creative ways to do it. It's, as Georgia pointed out, the capital costs combined with the operating costs are enormous. And we have a very small, narrow footprint of land to work with. Um, and it will end up being a very large feature, uh, a major large building um, when you deal with all the code requirements. And so, well, we're open to some creative solutions, but right now, um, that's what the city has told us we should be doing. Did it? Yeah, right. Now, now, yeah, now sorry. Um, I, um, I would just say putting public bathrooms on the Greenway would not be a good idea. First of all, the vandalism, the cost. You would have to have an attendant there, or it would never work. And you know that throughout. If you travel around the world, you know that it just would not work. Um, the Parisian toilets, the model that we have at the public library and by City Hall, I think that's the solution maybe in the sidewalk areas. Um, more of those because they self clean, you pay, they're maintained. Um, but to put them on the Greenway is just, your cost would be tremendous. Just vandalism alone. Um, and if you look throughout the city, if you look at the public garden, if you look at the Boston Common, there are zero toilets. People are constantly looking for them. There is no there's one on the com well, the one on the commons being turned into a sub shop. So, um, <laughs> but, but there, you basically don't know there are any, and there are there are not. So I think to look at some of those options with the Parisian type things along the sidewalk areas would be a yeah, great idea. Yeah, we really have. I mean, spent long and hard um, thoughts on, and it, it, it is a very difficult problem. Yes. Uh, would you uh, consider uh, doing the list? Of all the available bathrooms in the um, immediate area, so, I, they're actually they're actually listed on our map now. Yeah, all the public bathrooms yeah. are coded. That's why I was just uh, checking. I'm pretty sure we did. Yes. Yes. Um, <coughs> I want to thank Matt. He, he does a service by videotaping these meetings. He's videotaped a number of our meetings, and in fact, it drives a lot of the public to just go. We have other obligations, work and family obligations during the work day, so thank you so much, Matt. Um, two comments on two sides. First, the pavilion for the Harbor Islands has been truly magnificent this past year. Uh, I know it was built uh, through the efforts of National Park Service and the Boston Harbor Island Alliance, the not-for-profit, and it's really gotten so much more uh, interest in terms of people going to the Harbor Islands. The one problem still is the signage and the connection between the pavilion and the dock. And so we have worked with the Island Alliance, City of Boston, and such, and we would urge you to continue to be <coughs> vigilant in terms of being sure there's adequate signage going both ways so the public does know how to get to the, the water transportation. And the second is that Park in Chinatown. Uh, really want to commend the changes that you've made this past year to be responsive to the Chinatown community. And Helen probably better than anyone knows that, but there was a great deal of interest by the, uh, the Chinatown community to be sure, and I don't live in Chinatown, but we hear all the time, to have more uh, seating and also the umbrellas for shading, and that was put into place. And also, of course, the Mary Sue Park, which is just tremendous with the beautiful mural next to the um, the, the arch and such has really, again, made your park 
in the Chinatown area, much more user friendly for the Chinatown community. And I think that well, there's no one here to speak to that. I figured I'd stand up and at least say that was a wonderful improvement this past year. We thank you for that and want you to be sure to continue the maintenance in that area because it's just been tremendous today. So thank you very much. Well, our wonderful staff will, will be on Well, that James one. deserves a lot of credit too. Yes, yes. yes. I, I didn't even see him sitting, so yes, between the two of them, really Absolutely. incredible. And I think James, James has worked so much on that. We really do appreciate it. That's the sound. Um, okay, back to you. Got thinking about that. Um, all right, so what would um, anybody else like to say? This is not, we're not taking a vote on this or anything. This is just to try to get the information out to you and to have you ask any questions you might have regarding it. So seeing none, um, we will move the agenda and uh,